Welcome. It's my pleasure to have today with us for this interview, Judy Kang, who is a phenomenal violinist from Canada. Uh, and I'm going to start by mentioning this uh, quick, quickly, this incredible review you got in the New York Times when you performed the Brahms Concerto at Carnegie Hall. And Steve Smith, I believe, made the comment that you were probably the only musician alive to have worked both with Lady Gaga and Pierre Boulez. Uh, which is, you know, placing two, two corners of, of the music world, which one would normally not, uh, you know, place in the, in the same spot. So it, it was a remarkable but extremely accurate description of the type of versatile musician that you are. So let me start by thanking you for um, taking the time to, to meet with me and answer some, answer some questions and, uh, and welcome. Thank you so much for having me and for asking um, to, yeah, we haven't even actually really formally met. So this is really nice introduction to that as well. So thank you. Absolutely. So this is going to be, you know, an informal conversation. Well, I'm, I'm glad for you to bring any topics that you'd like to discuss as well. But let me, maybe since we're living in such unusual times during this coronavirus quarantine, sheltering in place, um, tell me what, are you doing these days? How are you coping with this quarantine? Do you manage to keep up your practice routine or how is life these days for you? Uh, well, life is, um, I can't really complain to be honest. I mean, you know, we hear on the news like, like all the things that are happening outside and it's like, you know, I feel pretty safe from, from that as, um, as far as just, um, I'm actually, I live in New York, but I'm actually in Canada now where my mother is. And so I've been here for the last um, almost two weeks now, and um, it's pretty um, quiet here compared to New York. So as far as just the environment, it's more peaceful. So um, I'm very thankful for that. Um, and as far as just like my routine, I mean, there's definitely a shift uh, with work and all that, and that's all of us. <laughs> so, um, but I've always sort of been in a home body as, as it is. So for me, it's just like um, being indoors is not like a huge adjustment as far as that goes. I mean, it's definitely different in, that, in the sense that I, I'm aware that I'm, I'm, there's limits now to like going outside and all that. But um, yeah, I, I tend to just kind of like have my own space and I'm uh, like, I'm pretty much adaptable to um, doing things and, you know, just kind of like working around situations. So I've been um, able to actually feel very inspired, if anything, to and motivated um, because I think it kind of shifts your perspective on things too, like things like this always, um, it gives us, you know, it kind of just brings us to a place where we step back and just kind of like, you know, our priorities kind of are shifted in the sense that maybe, you know, there, it's different for every person, but um, I think I, I feel like I've just been able to really uh, appreciate what I do um, and to really just like, I don't know, I, like it's, it's difficult, you know, the, the challenges that we all have and that we face. Um, I think that sometimes thinking about, you know, things moving forward, it can be scary, but in my mind, I've always sort of been someone who, um, is, I'm not a huge planner personally, so, <laughs> so I kind of like live like balancing like planning and being aware of, you know, what I need to do and at the same time being aware that things happen in life just like this and no one really saw it coming. And so just kind of like knowing that there's only so much you can really, uh, you know, know that's going to happen. And, and so for me, it's like, I do what I need to do for myself. And also um, at the same time, I really feel like a situation like this brings you to a place of not just reflecting on your own life, but what, how you are um, impacting or how you're affecting the world at large. So like how am I you know, connected to the things that are happening and, and what can I be um, to other people? So I think it's just sort of like balancing knowing what you have to do to survive in that sense, but also knowing that um, you're not, it's not like an exclusive, like um, living for yourself situation. You have to like, you're reminded that we're all in it together as people say. And, and it's, and there is a lot of truth to that, that like we are connected and what, everyone does impacts each other so so I'm just kind of like shifting my mindset to like a bigger picture and um, you know it's challenging it's not like something that 
just kind of happens overnight. It's a process and you learn to figure that out. So I think I've been trying to just figure out day to day, like how to um, be productive, but also be aware that um, the importance of life has a lot more to do with it's, it's outside of even what we do career wise. It's like, that's a small part of it really. So. Well, I'm amazed that, you, you know, you, you seem, obviously you haven't mentioned a single gig that you have lost. And obviously <laughs> you're such a busy musician, you know, you, you're, you're very sought after. So obviously I, priorities change and I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to hear that you're taking it this way and, uh, you know, thinking about the human part before anything else. Thank you. I mean, I think it's definitely a reminder. I mean, hope, hopefully so. Yeah. Yeah. So the next thing, just for, for those who don't, are not so familiar with you, um, I mean, I've been doing before, before this interview, a lot of research. I, I knew, even though we haven't met personally, we've been in contact via social media for a number of years now. Uh, so I've known about you, about your career. I've heard you, you know, your recordings. Um, but for those who don't know so much about you, um, and this might be a tough question for you, for you because you know, you're know you maybe one of those child prodigies where it's, it's tough to talk about your childhood and your first beginnings, uh, your training. You were so young when you started and very, very quickly you became extremely proficient on, on the violin. Um, but maybe you want to tell us a little bit how, how this started, how you started on the violin and, and you know how this trajectory took you to be, I believe, the youngest person to ever graduate from the Curtis Institute. Um, so anything you want to tell us about your first few steps with music would be nice. Okay, uh, so I started when I was four years old. And I mean, I, I feel like, you know, everyone has, you know, a similar story, in the sense that, you know, maybe their parents love music. And, you know, um, and I feel like my mom, she definitely never had the opportunity to perform. And, um, and she always loved listening to music. And she would play music in, in the house. And it was mostly classical. And um, I think she recognized that I just would sort of stop and pay attention to, to the music. And uh, I think it sort of culminated into like, you know, giving me the opportunity. So, which I'm very thankful for. And um, it wasn't easy because, uh, you know, we didn't grow up very um, privileged in the sense that, you know, I, I was able to just kind of like have everything handed. Um, but at the same time, I'm thankful that I had, you know, the opportunities that I had. And um, I think the story there, there's sort of a, a backstory to this where I think my grandmother actually, she also helped raise, raise me growing up. Um, she saw that I, um, I think in the hospital, she, she had like a vision, like she took a nap and she saw like a baby girl holding a violin. So that's sort of the legend story. Uh, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and uh, so I think that um, having started, um, I had a lot of, um, I was just, I think, really in a great place. Edmonton, um, there was some wonderful teachers. Um, I had uh, the opportunity to meet uh, the concertmaster of the Edmonton Symphony. And I think that was my first um, introduction to um, playing but I think I was a little intimidated. So I had another opportunity to study with um, a Japanese woman who um, was very motherly. And so I ended up staying with her for a few years. And so that's how it began. And I think it just sort of progressed really easily. I think um, I found it to be um, just a part of my life naturally. Um, I didn't really, I remember not really feeling like uh, it was something that, um, you know, I, I practiced maybe um, an hour a day or so. Um, probably, um, I don't really remember, but I think it wasn't like, um, a consistent sort of like, um, I've never really felt, um, uh, practice was something that I particularly enjoyed per se. I think I really enjoyed performing more so. So I think just like the preparation to knowing that I was going to perform was always something that I looked forward to. Um, and I started to really, um, enjoy, um, also improvising as a, as a child. So that's something that kind of came into place um, a few years into playing. And um, I think it just had a lot to do with the influence of being exposed to different kinds of music early on as well. And so I just, you know, I listened to a lot of different styles of music and I think it just sort of like organically progressed into like 
bringing like a lot of different styles into my playing. So I think I just enjoyed like having that balance of like working on classical music, practicing, but also uh, making up, you know, tunes that were just like something that I, I just enjoyed doing. So, um, and that sort of continued on as I was like in school and uh, taking lessons continually um, classically, but also just kind of like um, coming out of that and um, working on um, just collaborating with different artists. Uh, that's what I always enjoyed doing as well, so. And since you mentioned this, and since you're so eclectic in having worked with so, so many important people in so, within so many dif different uh, disciplines in the music industry, whether classical avant-garde or rock and pop, and you know, it seems like you're not afraid to challenge yourself and experiment and open all, all kinds of doors. So who would you say have been people who have really influenced you or have been either as mentors or colleagues uh, that you know, have left a mark on you? Well, everyone I worked with, I believe, like in, at Curtis Institute of Music, even from working with my teachers in Edmonton, where I grew up, um, have left a mark as far as um, there was an impact and influence. And um, I take away from um, all of my mentors and teachers. Um, I kind of, just being sort of a rebel in my nature, was, I, yeah, I would always kind of, um, you know, I, I would really respect what my teachers had to say, but in the end, I would kind of like pick and choose what I felt, you know, I wanted to take from everyone. And, and I mean, even to this day, I look back and I, being out of school for years, um, I will still kind of go, oh, wow, this is like something that I'm like understanding now. You know what I mean? Like at the time, you just kind of take it and you listen. And, you know, I think for me, it's all about like the feel of things more so than like the intellectual aspect. So for, for me, if it's I'm feeling it, it'll just kind of like, I'll go with that. But if I'm not, if it's not like kind of coming through that way, I'll listen to it and I'll just kind of take it. But even to this day, I'll, I'll you know, look back or I'll, uh, I'll come back to a piece like a Bach or, or uh, it doesn't matter what uh, repertoire it is actually, but it'll be something where it kind of like comes together in that moment where I'm just like, oh yeah, this is like what I'm understanding now. And it's, but it's like in an organic fashion. So uh, it's really cool to kind of be able to still feel that connection to my mentors, even to this day and just kind of like, oh, you know, this is what um, I'm hearing now, you know, I'm, I'm seeing and, and feeling. So um, in that sense, yeah, definitely like, um, so, like Sylvia Rosenberg is someone who comes to mind, Robert Mann, Aaron Rosenberg. Uh, there's just so many, um, Aaron Rosen, sorry. Um, there's just so many um, coaches that I've had that uh, I really appreciate. And uh, yeah, so I, I just, I definitely feel. And also uh, working with musicians that uh, from outside of the classical world as well, that inspire me that sort of are more so self-taught um, ha hadn't really had any formal education. Um, I find to be very inspiring because it's like a very different approach to how they're listening to things or learning. Um, but it's kind of like comes together. There's, there's a place where it all meets because I feel like, you know, when I kind of analyze how music is written or how it's created, a lot of it that's written down is just kind of like, instincts or your you know your thoughts your ideas that are just written on a page that is being like improvised in that sense but it's, it's a com composition of improv but it's written down so it's kind of like a very interesting sort of like uh formal sort of process of what's actually being created like in that moment it's it's kind of cool to just like see that there's that connection so it's not really i don't find like so many differences if anything it's just sort of like wow that's really a different, just a different way of like seeing how things are being um, written down or created. Uh, it's it's fascinating, and I, I definitely enjoy um, working with different artists for that reason because you kind of you are definitely like being exposed to different um, views and approaches, but at the same time you're also connecting with them because you're like, wow, this is really you know just like we're coming to the same conclusion in that sense, but in different ways. So it's it's kind of cool that way.
I wonder if you felt any anything like this also when working. I mean, I, I imagine you must have played a lot of new music, contemporary music. So I wonder if working with living composers, you've had similar kind of situations. Everybody's got their own language. Everybody's got different expectations or different priorities of what it is that they want from the performer. So yeah. how, how would you describe your experiences working, whether with your experience with Pierre Boulez, I believe you performed his piece for violin and electronics, uh, Anthem 2, um, whether in that experience or any others, uh, would you, how, how would you describe your experience? Um, well, I definitely felt uh, that was, there was a huge shift in working with him in the sense of he really uh, shifted my view on what's considered expressive music versus, you know, because I, I think that people have this view of certain compositions and, and analyzing a lot of new music. There's a lot of analysis, you know, of like how the composer came to this, and it's very technical. But I think what really spoke to me with a, and what st like stood out, and I remember is like he he said it's very expressive music. So everything that he wrote, there's there's an element of just like something that's connected to that deep part of you. That's not you know it's not about just finding and understanding a structure of a piece, which I feel like that's a tendency to do with music in general but also specifically new music and it's probably because the of the and like not being so familiar maybe with something new that you just have to find something that kind of like brings you like it's a bridge understanding a piece is probably something to that effect um or like i do know that a lot of I recognize some composers have a very formulated and it's very like intentionally formulated um structure to their pieces um, what I find interesting though is it kind of opened my mind to interpreting like older repertoire because like 90% of the, the time I work with new, new uh, compo like composers, living composers, they tend to um, change um, what's written depending on who's playing it, depending on what they're getting from hearing it. There's so many different things that will bring out, you know, and so, and they're discovering things all the time. So it's, there's always like an evolution to things. I, I wouldn't say 100% because it's, you know, it, it, it's not fair to say, you know, every single composer, but I would say like the majority of the people I've worked with, there's always this tendency to kind of ask maybe the artist to be, what do you think works better? What do you think? And, or, uh, oh, I'm hearing something different. Let's change that. Or, oh yeah, you're inspiring this idea or whatever it is, gives me an idea that, you know, I can't imagine like if we were to, you know, analyze Mozart or, you know, like there's specific composers, maybe are, you know, different personalities and different, you know, approaches, but someone like Mozart, like it's like just to kind of imagine him being so rigid and like, and for us to kind of put that box on someone like him, you know, and I found that to be, that stood out to me. And so I, my approach to just like music in general is, you know, it's very personal. I feel like all the Composers that I hear about or um, that I've worked with, for the most part, they are, it's a collaborative process with the person uh, performing it or working on it. So they're very much flexible to, you know, getting ideas or um, just, it's, it's like, it's very, like, it's a partnership. So it's just interesting to, like, imagine, like, working with someone like Mozart in this day and age or Bach or, you know, it's or Beethoven. It's like, it's crazy to think like what, how their compositions, how their approach would be so different in like a modern time. Like, you know, just with the different things that are also available and, you know, just, so it's kind of like, I, I have this more open sort of sense of like, you know, I think there's definitely a lot to be said of like traditional re like interpretation and the reason why people have approached things. So I understand there is, you know, a foundation to that, and I, and I honor it. But I also feel like you, know, you kind of lose a sense of, like, enjoyment, inspiration, and also individualism to music. Like, why are we all trying to play something um, ultimately to find how we think that a composer would want it versus, you know, how do we feel, like, what are we, like, connecting with just listening to the music and putting our heart into it and not like, and just like kind of letting go instead of trying to control it. It's like letting it sort of like speak to us versus, 
you know, like we need to like respect this, you know, the way this is written or that. And so I think it's just like, you know, finding and discovering that is the beauty of being an artist is like you're, you're discovering things as you go and it, it always changes constantly. Like it develops depending on so many factors, yourself and um, just your views and experiences in life and the things that have given you emotional um, experiences that connect with, with those. Um, Cause we tend to forget, I think, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm just speaking for myself, maybe it's like you, you kind of like to almost like neglect this like connection of your own um, heart and, and like what you're feeling and putting that into a piece versus separating, almost like separating you and going, okay, I'm going to just interpret what I think the composer wants and kind of like you're separating that. It's like, I don't know. I just feel like there is impossible. <laughs> yeah. And there is a sense of like, you know, something that is, like we can all unlock that and it'd be like such a beautiful thing. And um, yeah. And I love the fact that you mentioned Mozart as well, because as soon as you mentioned this idea of the composer being flexible and adjusting and making changes, I thought of him, um, you know, whether he was, you know, repeating Don Giovanni somewhere else, doing it in, in Vienna or in Prague, and he would say, oh, but I'm, I now have this tenor, so I'm going to actually change the idea and put something else there. Exactly. So I think it's, it's essential to keep this flexibility as a, as a composer, to work with the performers and make sure you, you, you do something that is the, the best for them. Uh, to, for them to shine for, for who they are, really. Um, anyhow, uh, uh, maybe something else that I'd really like to ask about this um, with regards to your practice routine, whether there is something you do on, you know, on a daily basis, you'd like to start in a certain way or finish in a certain way, or how do you, how do you organize your, your musical practice routines or if you have one? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. And I don't really have a routine when it comes to practicing, to be honest. I've never, as I mentioned before, I've never really been uh, huge on, I think, structural practice routines. Like, um, just ever since I remember, I just, um, it's like a lot of things that I do, I feel are, um, you know, just like, it, it stems a lot from just like the moment of inspiration. And I'm not an advocate of saying, you know, this is a way I would recommend everyone to be working. Um, it, it's just more so like an honest sort of like look, a reflection of like, how did I, you know, how, what are things that I personally also want to be better at and work, you know, and be more consistent because I, I see, I definitely like look at things and, and I go, okay, this is where I feel like if I just had a more consistent approach to practice, um, or, you know, just a more like s disciplined approach um, would help me more. Um, but I, I also feel like what works for everyone is different. That's the other thing I say is, you know, everyone, I feel like there is definitely a lot of uh, truth to like, you know, being consistent and um, putting your 10,000 hours, as they say, and all this, all the, all, all of that. But I really believe that, um, you also have to follow what kind of has helped you, you know, and, and I think that for me, I think the, um, the sort of like risk of, can't really like um, phrase it right now, but it's like, I'm kind of a risk taker as it is. So I think that like kind of living on that sort of like stress helps me actually like it's on the edge a little bit <laughs> yeah like like you know being a little bit like i'm a bit of a high strung person as it is so i don't feel like you know it's it's one of those things where like a psycho like you would analyze it with a psychologist like what would work for someone like who's high strung would be like being very calm and putting yourself in an environment that's really like you know gives you like this zen up you know just like environment to really thrive or is it really thriving off of like that weak not weakness but that aspect that very aspect that you don't feel you know is necessarily an advantage but you can like use it as an advantage so for me i think that like i've always sort of been like okay i have a concert in like you know month i need to start now or like whatever it is i have a, a concert in six months in this this piece um and i've always found it very hard to like start early you know and you know what i do know know is that from my experience that there is a balance. There's a healthy balance of, you know, working on something and um, being prepared, but also 
overworking is not, for me, is not good. I don't think it's good for anyone, to be honest, is to like, you know, over prepare, whatever that means. Um, having said that, I definitely feel like it's a balance. It's a balance of like, you have to put yourself in a place where you're comfortable enough to like give yourself freedom. Cause I, I, I definitely thrive off of um, being spontaneous to the point where it actually, it's, it's like, I go over the edge too much sometimes where I know that like, you know, I'm taking a huge risk by like in the spot and knowing that like in that moment, I could have like, like it, it's great that I took the chance, but if I did that on the 10th performance of this, would have been a lot better than the first one, you know, for example. So there is that balance of like knowing how much to take and all that. So the judgment aspect. Um, but yeah, I think oh, that, Sorry for the interruption, but yeah. I'm very curious since you mentioned this, have you felt any kind of constraint, for example, when performing a concerto as a soloist with an orchestra that there's an expectation from the musicians or from the conductor that, oh, don't take more time there because you haven't done it before. Oh, why did you phrase it differently this time or anything like this? Um, yeah. I mean, you, you seem to be a very natural, spontaneous musician, like you say, and uh, that's a wonderful quality. Uh, and some people are fantastic at engaging with this type of personality and musicianship. And some people maybe just need the safety net of, oh, we're doing the Tchaikovsky concerto. Please don't you dare to do that differently because I'm not going to catch your run there right. or anything like this. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good question because it, it definitely varies. Like, depending on how much I can uh, rely on knowing that the conductor slash musicians were all listening to each other and reacting. There's definitely like more freedom to be given in that situation where you're like, okay, I trust that we're all going to listen and react. But there's definitely orchestras that I've worked with that it's not like, you know, whatever the reason is, it's just, it's, it's like, this is the way it's going to be done. Like whether it's like intentional or they just don't listen or whatever it is. Right. <laughs> so that, when you know that you're going into that, it's, it's a disaster if you kind of decide, well, I'm just going to do what I want because it's just not going to work out at the end. So I kind of have to know what I'm working with. Um, but I noticed one, I, I realized one thing recently is that I am definitely a very reactive um, collaborator. So I, I will, um, if I hear something, I'll, in the moment I'll react to it, whether for good or for better or worse. So sometimes it's, it's not for my benefit. I'll be like reacting and it's like, oh, I shouldn't have, I should have stuck to like what I know because they're like, what they did wasn't like intentionally, it was like, it just like happened. And it's like, but if it's a musical intentional moment where you're working with someone that, you know, you just both know that you can kind of have this flexibility and kind of like trust it. It's, it's all about the trust factor. So I've definitely like found that recently where I look back and I was like, why is it that there's times you work with like, so it's like, it's with anyone, like, I'm sure you've probably experienced it where, you know, there's just um, certain musicians that you, you make you sound better. Like, you know, they, you just play with them. It's like, wow, like, I'm, I don't know why, but it's just happening. And it's because you're reacting to someone who's giving you that like momentum and that like it's extra like inspiration. And it just like happened. And it's like, it's a magical thing, but it happens and vice versa, where you're like, you know, you're so affected by what's around you that you can kind of like, not, it could go the other way. In other words. So like, I've definitely found that like, I'm, I'm so affected by my environment in that sense that I'm sensitive to that. But I am realizing like, I need to like, have the awareness of knowing when to do that, where it'll, like, it will flourish, it'll make the, the piece great versus it just kind of like, you're reacting, but it's not really like in the end, you know, enhancing the, the experience. Anyway, that's just something that I like had a, a sort of epiphany like recently. I was like, oh yeah, like, it, like, cause there's certain people that I feel like are just so consistent and they're, you know, it's like, it doesn't matter like what's being handed. And I feel like, like, that's the aspect that I'm like, okay, I really want to be able to be more you know, just kind of like stand my ground sort of thing in that moment. But anyway, it's all part of the learning experience. But yeah, def that's definitely like, a, that's, yeah, that's the, the, the thing. It's like, and you did a great description. I mean, it can be an extremely symbiotic relationship when everything clicks and falls into place. And there seems to be this constant dialogue influencing one another. Or there can be the, the opposite, the situation <laughs> where somebody's in 3D and the other one is in a black and white Photo. Right. Right. And really nothing ever matches uh you know and you can hear all the seams unfortunately <laughs> exactly. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah 
so maybe something else that would be really interesting to to mention and we're you know kind of probably approaching towards the the end of the time that we have but um i'd be very interested to hear your thoughts about since you've worked in both worlds you know performing concertos with orchestras playing with orchestras chamber music working with living composers and also with you know lady gaga doing a world tour with her what are some of these differences you see between this popular music world and the more academic or symphonic classical music world? What are some, some things that we as classical musicians could, could learn from this world? I mean, you've hinted already some of these things in the comments you made before, but I'm curious about some of the, some of the things that you think are radically different that could possibly, one world could influence the other. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, like, you know, I, I definitely approached the two worlds in the most authentic way I could. So it's like, I, I always feel like I'm sort of in the middle of either, not poppy enough, not classical enough, I'm sort of like somewhere floating in there. So I observe things sort of like as an outsider, I feel like. Like, I feel like a bit of an outsider in, in, in the sense that like, I look at classical world and go, yeah, there's definitely things that um, the mentality that I feel there's a sense of like, you know, I mean, it's not anything new that I'm saying, but there's definitely a sense of like, you know, the classical music is this, um, you know, the best kind of music, like, you know, like it's like this, um, very like sacred music and it's something that is just, there's nothing like it. And, you know, nothing matches that like pop music is something to look down upon and, uh, and I've had different reactions from people like, you know, some people are just like, that's so awesome that, you know, you're um, like it's experience and, you know, like, you know, like working with her must have been like, like, she's, she's actually a great singer. You know, it's like comments where it's like, she's actually, like, it's like, it's like a compliment, but it's like a bad kind of compliment where you're like, you know what I mean? It's like, so it's like you get already from just like the reactions of that. It's a sense of like, that's great but it's not like this respected sort of like sense of like oh yeah like you that like i respect it because the music's more like i respect it because the experience you know that you had so i i would say the mentality is the first thing you know just like this feeling of you know like superiority <laughs> i'm sorry it's the the feeling of, of superiority right that, yes that, that yes people just have this dogma that if you're a classical musician you're much superior to anything that is popular right Yes. And it's like, uh, it's a very cliched sort of, I mean, I, I definitely understand, I understand it. Like, I understand that the music, you know, it's just, that's, it's just that wonderful. And it's just that, you know, profoundly amazing. And, um, and I, I feel like it's just like, I think it's the idea of like not, not feeling like you have to compare the two because they're different. To me, it's different. I'm not, like it's not different, but it's different. Like it's like to me, I'm not like oh yeah, like class, like pop music is its own thing. It's like I, there's a lot of connections. There's more connections having done it to me. Like my in, in my you know sort of um, feeling is that I found more connections than not, if anything. Uh, but that's such a personal thing too. Like you know, I, I always I grew up like listening to pop music. And I enjoyed listening to it. So I think it's, it's like what you're used to as well. So you can't really, like, I can't really like, you know, blame someone in the sense that if they're not really interested in it, it's, it's like, it's all uh, what your, what your taste is in music as well. That's the other thing. It's like, if you're just, it's not your thing, you can't like force anyone. It's, and it goes the other way too. I think that's the other thing, like, just that brings me to, to like, trying to make classical music accessible. I think that's, it's great that, you know, there's all of these things that are, we're doing to like, you know, invite people to listen to it and make it more accessible to, to, um, you know, have the, the, um, you know, just the ability to like bring it to people, to audiences. But at the end of the day, people are not going to choose something because you told them to like it. They're going to like it or they don't like it. You, they, you just, it's just, that's the way it is. Um, there's definitely things that you can do to encourage someone to appreciate it. That's the word appreciate. Like I can appreciate something, but will I actually sit there and go, I want to listen to it and enjoy it? Maybe not. There's a difference as well in that. So at the end of the day, I, I'm at qualms because I do want people to listen to a, a Bach um, sonata or a prelude and, and 
just go, oh, like, do you hear that harmony change? Like, do you hear that? And I want people to actually experience what I'm experiencing kind of thing. It's because it's just such an amazing thing. But, you know, there's just so many, everyone just has a different experience with music as it is. Like, I'm not going to hear something the same way someone does, and I'm not going to experience something. So I think it's just like being able to uh, give the opportunity to someone, but at the end of the day, allow them to have their opinion and, and whether or not. And, and so I think this whole like sense of like trying to, you know, bring things to make things happen. It's, it's a little bit of a, like, I'm, I'm puzzled because I feel like, you know, there's not one way to do it. And, you know, I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? Like, cause I, I just feel like that's something that I've always wondered. Like I want to. Some people talk a lot about, you know, the concert experience and allowing people to come and bring drinks into the hall or um you know just making them feel more like there is not such a separation between their daily lives and some people you know react really very much against that and say no the concert hall is sacred and i want i want to put on my best clothes and go there and feel like it's a special evening uh, there are all these different tendencies and theories about what's the best um to be honest i think programming has been so stifled in so many of the orchestras around the world where, you know, if you're playing all the time the same pieces over and over and over, then of course people will not want any kind of change. Um, however, if, if people over, the, over time learn to perceive that the concert, every concert is a unique experience and that there can be something new that they can take home and that maybe they know that ahead of time, but Ultimately, I think it's just like you say, it's a matter of trust. It's not, um, you know, you need to trust that you're going to be exposed to something really good. Um, not just new because it's new, but, you know, new and fantastic. Um, so that, that to me is one of the most important things and what I think might, might help. And what in my experience, I've, at, at least I've seen that once you can, you establish yourself in a certain community and with your programming, um, you know, in my case with orchestras, um, you, you establish a sense of trust with the audience that, um, you know, I, as much as I'm doing the, you know, Tchaikovsky's Pathetic, I'm going to program something else that you probably have no clue about. Mm -hmm. But I trust that it's a wonderful piece of music. And, uh, you know, maybe, like you said, the first time they heard it, they're, and I've had this kind of experience talking to some concert goers that, uh, you know, initially they had not been exposed to this kind of repertoire. And then over the course of a number of years, they came back to me and they, they were very grateful that I had programmed some new music. And, you know, I always like to, not to speak a lot or, or give any kind of apologies for, oh, sorry, you're just about to hear this, but rather the opposite and say, you know, this piece of music is really spectacular and it deserves to be heard because of this and this. And, you know, just give a few hints, what to listen for here and there. I think this is all part of the, concert experience and it's just the same I guess with museums or art galleries that you know you can stick to featuring you know classic uh, Greek art or or you can have a contemporary exhibition and typically when that happens there seems to be I, I guess the visual arts seem to be a lot more open and welcoming to new ideas uh, I guess what goes through your eyes is is you know quicker quicker for people to apprehend and appreciate. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think it's up to us as musicians to to do our job fully and try to help people connect with the material that we present for them. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. Yeah, I definitely feel like um, the idea of like exposing people to like new music, I, there's an audience for every type of music. And sometimes like I feel like the new music, there's a new music audience and there's a classical because I, I found two different things happening just from people that I speak to because I, I ask my friends that are not classical music musicians or even musicians like I'll, I'll ask them like because they're the people that I want to know what what is your like honest yeah. feeling about you know and and so I hear two different things happening one is um I want I want to listen to Tchaikovsky concerto like I want to just hear Tchaikovsky concerto I don't care how many times like I'd rather just hear that and there's people who are like I, I don't mind hearing something new I like, you know, I, I want to, like, I want to know what else there is. Um, I hear some, some people go, I'm really not into the new music. Like, I don't understand it. I don't get it. So there's, I think at the end of the day, it, it just really comes down to like, 
you know, there's just preferences. People have preferences, but that shouldn't stop. Like you said, that should, like what I like is like that shouldn't stop us from giving the opportunity to them to just for them to decide. Because if we're limiting that, then it's like they have no choice. But if we're, you know, making it available, and I think that like anything that that's the I think that's what's the, the beauty of art though is that like it doesn't have to be something that you like I mean some art like I really it bothers me but it's like it affected me so that to me that's that's more impactful than something that I'm just like blase about like if something just really like yeah so I think that that's really what art is about is like if it, if it affects you in some way whether it's amazing great thing or if it's like terrible like I think that's the whole thing so um, you know, I, I, this whole idea of, of trying to like, you know, make things like bring audiences and all that, I think it's, it's something that we continue doing, but knowing that at the end of the day, allowing people to just kind of say, well, I'm going to choose to come back to that because I like it or, you know, discover something through it. That's maybe has nothing to do with the actual piece, but it's like connected to something in their own life experience. You know, it's because that's, that's the great thing. And I think um, this whole bit business mentality of like getting the audience there because we need to like keep the, you know, the, like the orchestras. Sell tickets and sell Yeah, yeah, all this stuff. There's a business aspect of everything in life. But I think that like, I've never been the most business and I'm, I'm working on it and I'm like seeing how I can really incorporate it. But I, I have to say that looking back, like for the most, everything that, that I've done, it came from a passion, it came from like, just the pure enjoyment of doing it for whatever the reason was, whatever that reason was. And it led me to like having the doors open. So, um, and maybe there was a sense of like um, that mentality, but it was like a very organic thing that I didn't even realize was happening maybe, but I never had this feeling. And so I think that like in my, I can only speak for myself, but like I found that like just kind of like following what you love and really feel like you're meant to be doing and being open to like, like, you know, meeting different people and hearing different views and, and not taking just like your own opinions, but like listening to other people's like opinions and what they, where they came from really like, it brings you to the place you need to be wherever that is. And like that, it, it's not even like a, you know, again, it's not like the, the career aspect of like, oh, it'll bring you this opportunity or that, but it's more so like just the passion of what you do will um, connect you with the people that also like are supposed to be in your life for whatever that reason is. And I think that's what I found happens. And I think that's, that's fulfilling to me. That's more fulfilling to me than like, you know, if obviously like I would love to work with amazing artists everywhere, wherever I can. And you need to have like those like relationships or whatnot. But, you know, I think it's just a balance of, of, of finding both, and in this time, I'm, I'm like, I think I'm like really like, it's really clear, like that sort of um, belief because now like with no distractions, I'm seeing things more like what's, what's really like gonna bring meaning to like, what's the purpose? What, why are we in the situation we are? I don't have the answers obviously, but I feel like this is a great time for, for people to like, kind of, I, th I think, reflect on that. And yeah. <laughs> so you're such a genuine, uh, wonderful artist. It's, it's been, you know, a real, real honor, pleasure to, to talk to you and learn much more about you. Thanks. And I, I thank you for your time. And, you know, I look forward to meeting you in person yes. uh, and, you know, plan some nice projects together as well at some point. That'd be really great, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you so much again, and all the best to you. Thank you. You as well. Take care. Take care.